the power of a father's love is incredible. You know, it's the, a, a, lovely, a, a true father will do anything to protect his family, will do anything to provide for his family. Anyone see that film? I can't remember what it's called now, but it was Russell Crowe, I think, and he was a boxer in the times of the Depression. Yeah. I can't remember what it was called. It doesn't matter what it was called. Cinderella Man. That's what it was, Cinderella Man. But I remember that they didn't have enough um, food and he'd come home and he was a boxer and he'd come home and he needed, you know, like fuel. Um, but there was never enough food and he would just so calmly hand it over to his children. It's okay, I don't need to give it to the children. That sacrificial father's love. And we're coming into that, that as we step closer and closer. I, I can't think of a better aspect of the father's love than Ephesians. So back to Ephesians chapter one. And I think we picked up, I don't know where we picked up, I can mark it. I know we can get through it all. Doesn't matter. Sorry? You try to finish at 14, right? Yeah, it's 14. Yeah. Okay. So let's just go back to Ephesians 1 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, the gospel of your salvation. And you believe in him, and you adhere to him, you rely on him, and you're stamped with the seal of the long promised Holy Spirit. You are actually stamped by the Holy Ghost. You are marked by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when you go anywhere you go, you've got the mark of the Holy Spirit upon your life. I often, when I pray for people, and we, we go and pray for justice or recompense or whatever it might be, we have a breakthrough in their lives. I often ask the Holy Spirit to come and put a seal. Put a stamp, a divine stamp, a seal over this time that we've had. So anything that was prayed can't be lost. We, we, you know, like I know he's the, the pledge for the future, the pledge of what is coming, the down payment, almost like the engagement ring, Shane. Mm -hmm. Almost like the engagement ring. However, the Holy Spirit is the seal of God, and there are things, you know, when God releases a dream to you, when he releases something to you, have you ever thought of sealing it? Holy Spirit, come and seal this. Put that wax ring on it, the ring, of the, the regal authority of Christ upon it. Because when a, a scroll is released, it comes, and it's come wrapped, but it's come with the seal of the king. You know, so when you enter into new things, new situations, ask for the seal, the stamp of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, stamp this time. Yes. Holy Spirit, put a stamp upon my heart. Like that, burn this within me. Holy Spirit, protect this. When a, when a thing is sealed, it is sealed from outside interference. Have you thought about that? It is sealed from outside interference. When something is sealed, out, it stops outside interference. How much do you trust in the seal of the Holy Spirit to protect you from outside interference? When he seals you, you're sealed. And the, the goal of that is to stop interference. To mark you as God's own peculiar possession. Sealed. No outside interference. And when you have an understanding of who you are in Christ and the power and the authority that you walk in because you're in Christ and Christ is in you and you walk in that authority and you walk in that power, you walk in him as he is walking in you. And I'll tell you what, the enemy cannot attack as much as we think he can because you're sealed, protected by the Holy Spirit. You know, there's that protection upon it. Do you know how he gets in? Our thoughts. He comes and lets us know, you know, he, he plays with our thoughts. He plays mind games. When you are wearing the whole armour of God, you have the whole armour of God on, mm. that helmet of salvation, and you pull down that face visor so no one can see your face, and you are enveloped in the whole armour of God, and Satan comes to attack. Who do you think he sees? Mm. If you are wearing the armor of God, he sees Jesus. He can't see your face because that helmet visor has been pulled out. 
you have so much more authority and power to walk in than you understand or revelation knowledge of. So you seal and you stand with the Holy Ghost. And I love that. He's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of life. He's the spirit of resurrection, life, and power. He's the spirit of Christ. He's the spirit of God. He's also the spirit of war. Yeah. It says that he's the spirit of judgment and of burning. He's the spirit of supplication. He is so many amazing, wonderful things. And if he has sent you, whatever it is that you need is found in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because when he brings the spirit of truth, that truth sets you free. When he brings that spirit of life, you are set free to live a life of more abundance. When he comes with that spirit of foresight that shows you things to come, you can be wisely and well positioned for the future. When he comes with a gift of discernment, you're able to say, yeah, I can trust them. No, I can't. He is amazing. He's wonderful. Wonderful. And he wants a much deeper relationship with us than what we've ever walked into before. Because with the things that we see, we hear like, you know, Smith Wigglesworth and Maria Woodworth Edda and um, uh, Saint Xavier, you know, who still looks like he's alive, even though he's been dead for over 500 years. And they trot him out every 10 years and he still looks alive. And they, they wheel him around the garden and people get healed and they shove him back in the tomb. But he still looks alive. His flesh is still, you know, like it looks, he looks still alive. But that's the power of life in him. You know, gotta understand you've got the spirit of life on the inside of you. And it's not you, you will never die. It is impossible for you to die. You are eternally alive. What does happen is the body says, okay, I'm ready for the new body. I want the glorious body. And the body just kind of, that's the only thing that wears out. But you are alive, eternally, gloriously alive. Yeah. Mm. I was reading, I don't know what I was reading. I so many books on my bed. There's no room for me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the books to the side, you know. <laughs> but I was reading in one of them, and it said, it was a commentary, and it said that when we died and were crucified with Christ, we're dead to sin, but we're also dead to sickness and disease. Mm. Because the old Adam is the only one that can have sickness and disease. The new Adam, Christ, cannot. So if I was crucified with Christ, I am dead to sickness and disease. Yeah. How freeing is that? Yeah. How amazing is our God? And so he says, you've been stamped because, you know, we no longer live in the old Adam. We live in the second Adam, the last Adam. We live in Christ, and He does. He is our. He is us. We are Him. And it says in verse fourteen that the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. He's the guarantee yeah. of our inheritance. He's the first fruits. He's the pledge. He's the foretaste. He's the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of our full redemption and our acquiring complete possession to the praise of God's glory. And three times through the first 14 verses in Ephesians chapter 1, it says to the praise of God's glory, to the praise of God's glory. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of what is to come. He's the guarantee of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's the guarantee that you are the bride of Christ. He's the guarantee of eternal life. He's the guarantee. He's the down payment. He's the deposit that God has paid down to say, yes, everything I promised you is coming to pass and it will happen. He is that guarantee and it is awesome and amazing to take hold of that and to recognise that if he is the guarantee because the Holy Spirit is God himself, if he is that guarantee, nothing can be stolen from you. Nothing can be taken from you. Your future is assured. The resurrection life is assured. The rapture is assured. It's all assured. Because he's the guarantee. It's not a man who's guaranteed it. God himself, in the form of the Holy Spirit, has guaranteed it. It's a guarantee. Oh, my goodness. You know, that's enough to make you do cartwheels around the church. <laughs> I was in a church, a church service once where the Holy Spirit went a bit ballistic. Awesome. It was wonderful. And, and the pastor's sister, was. everybody was on the floor in various stages. And um, the, the pastor's sister crawled on her hands and knees over to a chair. And her hair was up in a nice bun at the beginning of the season. <laughs> but at the end of the evening, it's, it's all down. And, and, you know, like it's just. And she crawls over to the chair and she pulls herself up on the chair. And she's still, you know, knees on the floor from the chair. She's boy, Lord, you sure know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> And then we had one guy come up and say to the pastor, 
I just think God's told me to somersault across the, the back of the stage. And the Holy Spirit said, well, if, oh, sorry, the pastor said, well, if the Holy Spirit told you to do it, you better do it. And that was what broke the meeting open. This guy somersaulted right across the stage at the back of the stage. He somersaulted right across and then he somersaulted back. Well, it just broke the meeting open. We've never seen anything like that in church before. And it just like, wow, and everybody fell apart and the joy of the Lord dropped and everybody's on their knees. And the Holy Spirit just took over and he ministered to people. You know, when he comes, he ministers. He doesn't just come to show off. He comes to minister and he ministers through joy and he ministers through people doing somersaults and he ministers to anything. You know, there was a, a story in the, in the Sunshine Coast of a, a woman and, the, and she, you know, loves the Lord. And the Lord said to her, I want you to go and stand on your head in that butcher shop. And she said, that can't be you, God. You wouldn't, you wouldn't ask me to do something like that, but it wouldn't go away. And then she said, but God, I can't do it. I'm wearing a dress. And then she thought, well, I'm just going to go home and get changed because it wouldn't go away. But there was a peace with it. You know, like if you're feeling a bit frantic, it's not a good sign that it's the Holy Ghost. But there was a peace with it, even though she's feeling very kind of like confronted. That's not what I do. I'm not that kind of a lady to stand on my head in a butcher shop. But she went home and she got changed and she came back and she went into the butcher shop and she said to the butcher, please excuse me for a minute, I just need to do something. And she went and stood in the corner and stood on her head. And the butcher broke down because he said he was ready to commit suicide unless God proved that he was real. And he said, God, I'll only believe if someone comes in and stands on their head. And God loved that man so much that he sent someone to do it. So when the Holy Spirit comes, I'm telling you that the structures that we put in place, we can't have. Yeah. Right, and the Holy Spirit tells you to stand on your head in the butcher shop, you do it. The Holy Spirit tells you to yeah. somersault across the back of the stage, you do it. You do whatever He tells you to do because one of the key things to flowing with the Holy Ghost is obedience. <laughs> and I've got, I've got stacks of books on the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit, I, and I love Him, and I love all the things that they bring out about Him and, and, and everything. But the thing that challenged me was out of all the books I've read, only one book talked about obedience to the Holy Spirit. Wow. All the others were about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit, the symbols of the Holy Spirit, but only one book written by Cash Luna in honour of the Holy Spirit, which we did have, but I think we've sold. That is the only one book, the only book that talked about obedience. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 He said, he's, he's going to break down some barriers that we have in our lives. Yes. Yes. You know, well, I'm not the kind of person that would do that for me, Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of a person. <laughs> but then you go, okay, maybe your hand. <laughs> and you do it, you know. But he has so much fun. He's brilliant. Oh, okay. He's brilliant. If you ask him, I've got a friend who's who's um loves the Holy Spirit, she's really going through a dark time. So she's asking him to come with her and do everything, everything from hanging out the clothes, you know, to sweeping the floor. Holy Spirit, would you come and help me do this? And do you know what he says? <laughs> I'm brilliant at that. I'm brilliant at that. Brilliant at hanging out with clothes. Brilliant at sweeping the floor. But that, that very attitude of the Holy Spirit, I would love to help you. Because that's his assignment from God. Isn't that his assignment? He's our helper. So when he helps us, he is fulfilling God's assignment. God actually assigned a part of himself, the Holy Spirit, to help us. Like, and he delights in helping, just like a father loves a father. And Yeshua loves to save. Holy Spirit loves to help. And the more we press into that, say, Holy Spirit, will you help me? Sure. He does. It's sure. just so beautiful. Holy Spirit, you're the one who shows me things to come. Will you show me what's coming? So I can be well positioned, so I can be wise about the future. Holy Spirit. You're the one who goes into the council room of God. You, you, you're there. You can let me know 
what's going on in the council room. And he delights in it. And when you start to involve the Holy Spirit in your life as a helper, you will find so much more joy and delight in everything that you do. And for those of you who know Elizabeth, who was with me when I started Open Head, she had a, a necklace that she, you know, would have to take off to get in the shower. It's always a struggle to find the thing to do it up around your neck. And she struggled and struggled for one day. She said, Holy Spirit, you might help her. Can you help me to do this up, please? And just like that, the necklace was done up. And so every day she would ask the Holy Spirit. When she forgot, it was a struggle. When she asked, it was so easy. We need to be involved with the Holy Spirit, engaged with the Holy Spirit so much more than we are. Engaged. And stay engaged. Hey, Shay. Stay engaged. So the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He's the down payment. He's the deposit. He is a powerful, personal, living presence of God Almighty living, living within you, leading you and guiding you. And God makes himself known in and through Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Do you know we are blissfully blessed? Mm -hmm. Blissfully blessed in, in, in Christ. Blissfully blessed. Robert in 1 Timothy 1.11 talks about the uh, glad news of a happy God. And Moffat's translation uses the word bliss, 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 all the way through. You are blissfully blessed, blissfully blessed. That's that expected joy. That's that that's that joy that comes out of the inside of you that's birthed in Christ himself. And he's, there's a grace and there's a peace and there's a spiritual blessing. And just going back over how much the Father loves you, this is what he declares about you in Ephesians. He says that you are blissfully blessed in Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Saviour, and your King. But in Christ, you have grace and peace. You have every spiritual blessing. You're chosen. You're holy. You're blameless. You're adopted. You're accepted. You're redeemed. You're forgiven. You're given wisdom and insight. You're given knowledge into God's mysteries. You're given an inheritance. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You live for the praise of God's glory, and all things are consummated in Christ to the praise of his glory. All things are consecrated and consummated in Christ. Have you ever asked God to bring in all the scattered pieces of your life, all your soul, all the things that have been shattered and scattered? And Holy, Holy Spirit, would you please consummate everything that is, is scattered in my life, bring it back and consummate it in Christ. Make it whole in Christ. Make it complete. The word of God must be everything. Mm -hmm. It's the first word, it's your last word, it's the device, deciding factor, it's everything. But it's got to flow out of your inner man. And so after these 14, 15 verses of absolute praise to God, the how he loves us. Because that's what Paul is praising God for, the sheer love of the Father for us, blessed, chosen, and in the beloved, accepted, all of these wonderful things. He goes into a prayer, and the rest of the chapter is a prayer. And in that prayer, he says there are three things that he wants you to know. So let me read the prayer, and it comes out of, um, I've got the apple pie. So Ephesians 1, verse 16. I don't cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers. For I always pray to God, to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets and a deep and intimate knowledge of him, that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light, that you know and understand the hope to which he's told you, how rich is his, glory, his glorious inheritance in the saints, so that you can know and understand the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power in us and for us because we believe, as it was demonstrated in the working of his might and strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So where are we, according to Ephesians 2.6? Are we seated with Christ in heavenly places? Yeah? yeah. Well, have a look. And what that means. And the very next verse says that we are far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. 
above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but in the age and the world which are to come. And he has put all things under his feet. And if we are in him, all things are under our feet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, do you understand how much authority you have? How much glory you have? How much power you have? How much of the presence of God that you carry? It is so, if you are full of it, you are far above all rule and authority. You're far above any kind of power or dominion. You are far above anything, any title, any name anything and all things are under your feet and he has appointed him Yeshua the universal and supreme head of the church and every time I read that I say Father God I thank you that you have put all things under the feet of, of Yeshua and you have appointed him the universal supreme head of the church of open heaven ministries international for we are part of his body the fullness of him who fills all in all for in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and fills everything everywhere with himself oh my gosh you don't need a sermon you just need yeah. to get into Ephesians you just need to you just need to allow the Holy Spirit to, to open it up to you and to say you are seated far above you know why do we pray Oh, you are seated far above the principalities and the powers and the works of the darkness. You're seated far above any title that can be named. You're seated far above cancer. You're seated far above unemployment. You're seated far above poverty and debt and lack. You're seated far above accidents, incidents, and delays. You're seated far above anything that comes out of the world system. You're seated far above. Oh my gosh, if you could just get a handle on that. So you know what? I live from that place. I don't come back to earth. I stay up there. I live from that place. I live by faith. And I live from that place so that if anything stays under my feet, he's under my feet. He's under, he's under, he's under, he's under my feet. He's under my feet. I can't remember the rest of it. To the end of his And took back by his Come on. 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 Maybe we need to put the word Satan on the soles of our shoes. Yeah. Just to remind us, he's under your feet. And you have seen it far above. Yeah. You know, the, the snake line. Um, they don't go above a certain line in, in the mountains because if it gets too cold, they can't live. And so there's something called the snake line in America yeah. um, and Australia, where the snakes don't go any higher because if they go past that line, they, they freeze to death. So if you um, in this, you see it in the heavenly places, you are above the snake line. You are above the You are above the Oh my gosh, if you just need the immunity and the impregnable position that God has placed you in, it's a whole different thing. But in this, in this prayer, in Ephesians 1, he says, um, he calls in the God of glory, and he says the first thing he asks for, um, I want you to give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you would open the eyes of your heart, yeah. that you would see things, that you would grow in the deep and intimate knowledge of him, that the eyes of your heart would be flooded with light, yeah. that that is your imagination, that your imagination, your sanctified imagination would be flooded with light, so that you can see things that you would never normally otherwise see, that you would see what he wants you to see, that you would see from being seated in heavenly places, looking down from Christ's perspective, that the eyes of your heart are flooded with light, that your imagination is, is just so like released in the realm of the spirit. And he says, so that you can know and understand three things. The very first thing he says, I want you to know the hope to which he has called you. What is the hope to which God has called you? So why don't you just take a minute now? Because I know we've got resurrection and um, rapture and everything else. But there is a hope to which he has called you. Ask the Holy Spirit, what is the hope 
we call each other. What is the hope you've called me to? And you will need a spirit of wisdom and revelation because what he's going to show you is far beyond anything you can think. What is the hope to which he has called you? See, when you see things like this in the Word, you stop and ask the question. And that word know is yada, and it means intimate knowledge. Intimate. Not a surface thing. The second thing is, I want you to know about how rich is God's glorious inheritance in the saints. How rich is his inheritance in you? How rich is his inheritance within you? So you stop and you ask yourself the questions when you see. So Colossians 1.12 says, We give thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints in the light. So what is, what is his glorious inheritance in the saints, in you? Colossians 1.12. And then the last one is in verse 19. So that you can know and understand, get this, this is the amplified. What is the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power in and for you who believe? As it was demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And there's power, one is dunamis, another one is kratos, another one is azusia. There's all these shorts, there's all different meanings in the Greek. But the thing that's, that's happening here is he's saying you need to know the surpassing greatness, the immeasurable greatness of the power of God that resides on the inside of you. Right? If, if you really knew that that power was there, then we wouldn't think twice about praying for someone with cancer because of the, the, the immeasurable surpassing greatness of the power of God is within you. And in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I can't remember the verse, but it says that the people, Paul wanted the people's faith to rest in the power of God. Yeah. So, you know, we need to have an understanding. Paul, Paul was saying, oh, guys, he's probably not saying guys, but I'm saying guys. We need to have an understanding of the greatness, the immeasurable, surpassing greatness of the power of God. He created the universe. And yet he lives on the inside of you and he's deposited that power on the inside of you. But we don't release it. We allow circumstances to dictate to us. Well, I only get so much a week. The business isn't doing so well this, this month or, you know, this is happening or that's happening. And we accept the circumstance instead of saying, I release the power of God against into this situation. I release the power, the supposed greatness, the immeasurable power of God. I release that into this situation right now for the will of God to be done on my behalf. In Jesus' name. See, we've got to get to the stage where we will not accept anything that does not come from the hand of the Father. Limited incomes, rusted down cars, rented homes, speaking to myself. But when we release the surpassing greatness of the immeasurable power of God into situations and circumstances, Things change. Let me tell you what didn't happen with Abram. 
There was a famine in the land in Genesis chapter 12. There was a famine in the land and he went down to Egypt. Do you know why he went to Egypt? Because of the famine. God didn't tell him to go. In fact, he didn't even pray about it. He just went down to Egypt. The famine forced him to make a decision because he felt there was no other decision he could make. He felt that he was trapped. He was in an area that was in the famine so bad. I've got all this cattle. I've got everyone to look after. I'd better go down to Egypt where it looks good. But God didn't tell him to. And because he went down to Egypt, because he picked his wife, because she was sold into or given to Pharaoh, and then when Pharaoh realized what had happened, he had to pay all this redemption. So there's a lot of wealth that, that Abram got there that really should be a got it. But also in that, there was Hagar, the mother of Ishmael. See, when we, when we accept situations and circumstances and, and, and think that, well, this is the only choice I have, this is all that's available to me, this is what this is it, we get time bombs in our lives. Abram and Sarah were unaware that Hagar was a time bomb waiting to go off in the shape of an Ishmael. Yeah. But if they had, if he had asked God, if he had understood the power of God, you know, released, oh, the surpassing greatness of the power of God into this famine, yeah. maybe the famine would have stopped. Maybe he would have got another direction from God to go somewhere else, but he got back to Egypt. He went back to the world system according to symbolic, sim, symbolism. Mm -hmm. And we don't, want to, we don't want time bombs. Mm -hmm. And if you go through the Bible and you can see time bomb after time bomb after time bomb that Satan has placed in there because of compromise yeah. that will yeah. not go off until people are in a place of position or promotion or, 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 you know, attention is placed upon them for something and then all of a sudden, kaboom, there goes the time bomb, there goes Ishmael, there goes whatever, and it, it happens right through the Bible. The, the time bomb goes off and, and destruction happens, sometimes for generations. So we've, we've got to learn to start releasing the surpassing, immeasurable, unlimited power of God in the situations and circumstances. You will shift. You will turn around. I release the power of God into you for the abundant life that Jesus said he's given me. Body, you will shift. You will turn around. You will receive the abundant re the release of God's greatness, of his power on the inside of me in sickness and disease. You will dry up and be cast out in Jesus' name. We've got to start using what we've got, guys. The reason that we're, we're in the state that we're in, our lives are in the state we're in, and I'm pretty, pretty blunt with myself as well. The reason that we're here is because we have not fully taken advantage of who we are in Christ. We haven't taken advantage that we're seated in heavenly places far above, that we're in him and all things are under our feet, that the surpassing greatness of the power of God is on the inside of us, ready to be released any time we release it by the words of our mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, if we had an understanding of this, Things would change. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, I think it's verse 10. It says that when they let me just turn that, let me just read this is this is Old Testament, right? Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I think it's verse 10. It says, verse 9, the Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Well, Jesus met every qualification of the law. He fulfilled the law, right? So that's been met. So verse 10, all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. They shall see that you are in the presence of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. When was the last time you walked into your, your current politician's office and they weren't afraid of you? When was the time you walked into the bank manager and they weren't afraid of you? When was the time that you faced some kids on the streets and told them to get their life in order and to stop harassing that little, other little kid? They weren't afraid of you. But this is, this is what God expects us to carry. And this is Old Testament. Let me tell you the only reason you can get into this is when you fear the Lord. Yes. When you fear the Lord. 
and the fear of the Lord comes upon you, and people are afraid yeah. of you. Yeah. That is the key, the fear of the Lord. Like, that is all just right. But we sort out some stuff. Mm -hmm. We can confront some things. We can change some things. But we haven't taken advantage of who we are in Christ. You read a thing that's one blessed, chosen, forgiven, redeemed in Him, but all of those amazing things, blessed, redeemed, spiritual blessing. And I need you to know this, and I need you to know the hope of your calling. I need you to know the greatness of the inheritance of God. I need you to know the power of the greatness of God that you carry. We start to know these things. Then you see the final mark. See, that's why the whole of Ephesians. You've got to know all of this before you can step into warfare in chapter 6. If you go into warfare and you don't know that you're seated by the Bible, you can be taken out, you can be back, you can't attack. If you go into warfare and you don't know that he's under your feet, the battle's a bit bigger than it should be. If you go into warfare and you don't know that the power of God's on the inside of you, so there's some things that we have to accept. In the natural, we might not look like much. We're all beautiful looking bunch. But in the natural, it doesn't look like Satan's under my feet. In the natural, it doesn't look like I'm seated in heavenly places, Father God. In the natural, but in the spirit. <laughs> In the spirit, that is the truth, and that is who you are, and that is what you are expected to live like by the power of the Holy Ghost. You can't hide anymore. <laughs> can't. How can light hide? Yeah. Can't hide light. <laughs> this is the power of the new creation. This is the new creation. This is who you are. The who you were in the old Adam was crucified. Thank God. Dead and buried. Gone forever. You are in the second Adam. You're in Christ, in him. Thank you know, um, a whole different, a new creation. No, nothing like you've seen on earth before. <laughs> and so that means this has got to change. If you've got to write Satan on the soles of your feet, write on the shoes, write it on the soles of your shoes. So that you can invite yourself. He's under my feet. Every step I take, he's under my feet. Every step I take, God gives me that ground. And no one is able to stand against me all the days of my life. I guess it's the truth. This is the truth. Whatever Jesus did, you can do. Plus greater works. Yeah. And you know what we need to repent of? Louisa had us repenting of things before. Let me tell you what we need to repent of, really. Is that in Father Lord, we are in Christ as a new creation. I'm resorting back to the flesh. I'm going back to the soul. I'm listening to our mind. I'm going to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of going to the tree of life, Jesus Christ himself. That's what we need to repent of. That Father God, I've read Ephesians. How many times have you read Ephesians? How many times have you seen what Paul has said about you, chosen, blessed, in the beloved, accepted, forgiven, redeemed, and yet still not lived it out? This is actually a call to war. Because it ends in Ephesians 6 with war. But you cannot go to war with defective thinking. You can't go to war with defective armory. You can't go to war with a defective armor. You can't go to war with anything defective in your shoes. And so Paul was saying right here, if you start in Ephesians 1.1 1, 1, and follow it all the way through to Ephesians 6.10, when you enter into the armor of God, you are ready to be, to be the victorious one. Jesus. But you need to know who you are. And more than just recognize it in your head, it's got to come out of your spirit. It's got to come out of who you are in him. You know, when it talks about that double edged sword, it means God spoke it, I spoke it. It's got to be revelation. Woo! Information will not change anything. Yeah. Information you can be talked out of. You re rationalize something, somebody can come along with a better argument and you'll lose the argument. But when it is, Revelation, when you know that you know that you know, 
that's when it changes everything. And quite often we step into things thinking that we know, but we've got head knowledge yeah. only, mm -hmm. and it's not a knowing out of our inner being, it's not a knowing out of our spirit. Because I can tell you right now, I don't care what anybody says and what any situation I face. I know I'm seated in heavenly places. Wow. I know I'm above the snake line. I know that I'm far above anything and anything of second heaven. I know that and I can't be talked out of it. I will not be pulled down into the earth or the second realm to deal with the enemy. I deal with him from the third heaven, from the authority of Jesus Christ. You've got to get to that place where you do not compromise, you know, and you know who you are. Oh, my gosh. Victory, victory, victory is ours, but only. And it's not conditional because Jesus has met everything. This is the thing. And I'll finish with this because this is the thing. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus has finished it. The work is finished. It's done. It's done. Um. You know, and you are in heaven. He is you. It is your body. So if he started, you, you get the victory. You're more than a conqueror. You won the victory. But man, you walk it out. You live it. You've got to get this. It's not with human beings. I'm a, I'm a spirit being having a human experience. But who I am? I'm in Christ. Yeah. I had somebody ask me once, who do you think you are? Yeah. Uh, my father's not. I walk in the light. I speak the truth. I am. A, I am a child of the Most High God. I'm near a God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Do you really want me to tell you who I am? Because if you take me on, you're taking on the enemy, the, the, the government of heaven that backs me up. You're taking on the angels that surround me, and you're taking on my Lord, Savior, and King Jesus Christ. Do you really want to know who I am? Because I'll tell you. You gotta have that. You gotta have that. You know, we. I remember we took in um, a couple of girls and teenage kids years ago. My kids were teenage kids. We took in some teenage kids, two girls that had been taken into a bikey gang, and we, we kept them for a while until they found their feet. But one night. Bikies turn up on my front porch. Mm. About three of them, I think. And I'm thinking, oh boy. But praise God, I had amazing pastors who really um, drilled us yeah. with who we were in Christ. Mm. So I had one of the children get on the phone and ring the pastor and say, it's some prayer happening. And I opened the door and they said, we want the girls. And I said, no. It's one word, no. Yeah. And they walked off. Mm -hmm. They just turned away and walked away. And they never came back. I don't know what angels they saw. I don't know what they saw, but no. Yes. Uh, and those thoughts were safe for a little bit longer until they, they you know, moved on. That's all it takes. You've got to know who you are. Like, who are you? Tell yourself who you are. Oh my gosh, as is he, so am I. <laughs> as is he, so are we. Yeah. You know, like as he is. <laughs> Resurrected, amazing God. So are we. We've been crucified. We were nailed to that cross. We, we died with Christ. We were buried, but we rose again. And we are victorious. And we are ascended. And we are a different species now. We're a new creation. Oh my gosh. Know who you are. Know who you are. Seated well above principalities and powers. Oh. Speak to the circumstances in your life. Release the power that's resident within you into those circumstances. You don't have to accept anything that God doesn't want you to accept. Not a thing. Nothing. Yeah. 
And if you could see yourself the way the Father sees you, your lives would be totally different. My life is more fair, transforming, more fair. More and more, the more revelation I get, the more change comes. The more established I am in Christ, the more I know who I am, the more I know the authority that goes with it, the more I know that if I'm going to walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, I must be submitted to his authority over my life. The more I know that the only truth is the word of God. That's the only thing that is relevant to me is the truth of the word of God. What does the word of God say? What does it say? Do the whole council, starting one scripture, do a cross-reference, come right back, so you've got the whole council of God. But what does the word of God say? Mm -hmm. What is in your life that does not line up with what the Father's will for you is? Mm -hmm. And then address it with a righteous indignation. How dare you be like that in my life? How do you want this? Mm -hmm. There's some days you will walk around the queen, I am blessed out of blue the teeth. <laughs> because it doesn't look like you're blessed. But we don't go by what we look at, by what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight. And the very first thing Paul said is, Father, give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Open the eyes of their heart. So I might be speaking, I'm blessed out of gritted teeth. But the eyes of my heart have been enlightened and I know who I am. And it might just be gritted teeth for a little bit, but I know the blessing will manifest that I live under showers of blessings. It's just the flesh that grits its teeth. It's just the unrenewed soul that says, seriously, Suzette, what are you doing? Change. Change the way you see yourself. Ask the Father. So I release over you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you can see this answer. 